Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Duke, Duke Royalty results presentation for the year ending March 31st, 2021. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged, can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. These will be available via your InvestorMeet company dashboard and we will notify you by email when they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll and if you'd be so kind as to give your attention to that, we'd be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand over to Hugo Evans, CFO, and Neil Johnson, CEO. Good morning to you both. Good morning, Mark, and good morning, good morning everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll start. It's uh, Neil Johnson, the CEO. Um, and uh, welcome to our Financial 21 uh, results presentation. Uh, this, These are results from March 31st or April 1st, 2020. To March 31st, 2021, and so what a uh, what a year it was. It was right at the very beginning of of the pandemic uh, that we started our financial year, and and so um, we're really pleased uh, that um, that we have so many shareholders on this call, and um, and that um, that we have uh, we have some good news to present for you today. Um, but before I hand over to Hugo, I just want to set the scene. Um, a, a little bit about what is and who is Duke Royalty. Um, we're an alternative finance uh, company, uh, not a fund, but, a, but an investment company that uh, provides a minimally dilutive capital uh, that has no refinancing risk for private owner managed companies uh, that are profitable. So uh, what that in effect means is that uh, for companies that are strong and long-standing and profitable companies, we provide um, a capital for them without losing control and the no refinancing risk and, and no uh, dilution, uh, significant dilution to the owners. That is what appeals to them and what we can provide to them because we are a public company in a long-term uh, long basis. So I'll get to that, but um, just uh, for this slide number three, <clears throat> we have uh, today 11 royalty partners, but we have, uh, we've uh, had 16 different partners. Five have been refinanced out. We'll get to that. Uh, 140 million pounds now has been deployed since inception, and we are recycling some of the capital from the capital that we get back from our refinancings. Uh, we are the uh, one and only um, royalty, corporate royalty provider um, in the UK and Europe, and uh, the only one listed on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, we do have competition, but mostly mostly bank loans, um, and we don't really compete with private equity because we are not looking for companies that are for sale. Um, we will talk about our resilience in COVID-19. I'll leave that for, for Hugo. Um, but the tenets of, of our investment thesis is that we provide a strong dividend. And, um, and we have, uh, we've had a dividend yield ranging from five to 8%. Uh, we pay quarterly cash dividends and uh, we have since our inception. And um, uh, what we aim to do is, is increase the dividend by becoming a bigger company and uh, putting more capital to work. Um, that is because, as I said, of the company structure, we are salaried employees and not a percentage of, of our capital. Uh, therefore, the operating leverage is high. We're very, very cash flow generative and, um, and we have long-term embedded growth into the, into the royalty contracts that we, that we have. Um, we're also really pleased kind of in a post COVID world to have a growing market and we can talk about our market opportunity and how we sit within, you know, the, the non-bank finance, uh, industry, which is very, very large. And, um, we don't do all things we don't have a solution for all situations. We're not all things to all people. Um, but I think we have a very uh, strong and robust uh, market to go into. And why don't we 
return to exactly what we do. Um, hopefully, uh, I'll, I'll canter through this. Um, I, we can take questions about it in the back, but for the for the shareholders, this might be old news. Really, what a corporate royalty is is we we don't do mining or music royalties that. You know, we predated a lot of those companies that you might uh, know on the London Stock Exchange and AIM these days. But uh, a corporate royalty is more like a corporate mortgage. It's a long term participating loan um, that is not a direct percentage of sales. Um, what we do is we provide a lump sum of capital and, and have that term of this long term loan of about 30 years. That's our tradition. And so it acts like a, a mortgage and you are <clears throat> at the end of the 30 years, you have no more obligation. Hence, there's no refinancing risk. Um, what you have to pay is actually a percentage of, of, the, of the capital that we have provided, not a direct percentage of revenue. So, for example, 10 million pound uh, capital injection will uh, on average be 1.3 million pounds of revenue to Duke Royalty. Um, the, the, tr the royalty aspect or the participating aspect is adjusted once per year based on the revenue growth or decline of the business. And um, in currency terms, that is adjusted. It has a collar and a cap. So it's uh, very steady. And, um, and if we do our job right, uh, more years than, than, than less will be a positive adjustment. And um, so you can see if, if that 13% um, was day one, the adjustment in any one year can only be another 0.7. Um, and, uh, and then that 13 would be 13.7. That 13.7 could adjust plus 6%. So it is compounding adjustments. Um, so uh, the other uh, interesting aspect of this is that our total obligation, i.e. our return to all the shareholders, can be serviced out of the, the current cash flow of the company. So we do not need a, an exit event, which is a revolution for uh, owner-managed businesses. They either have private equity that need to return their capital, so they need to triple the EBITDA and then sell out as quickly as possible. Um, banks need to be repaid their capital. Um, and there's a lot of aggressive uh, amortization payments these days after a couple uh, credit crises in the la over the last uh, 10 to 12 years. Um, so uh, the the no bullet repayment at the end of the term is a, is a key tenant of, of our, of our, um, of our uh, way we finance. The, the, the point of, of this, as I've already mentioned, is that companies can pay back, buy back the royalty. And uh, we usually have a non-call period of three years, but then after that, for any reason, they can, they can pay us back. It does come with penalties. It's kind of like your, your house mortgage. You're gonna have to pay penalties to get out of the mortgage, but you do not, the bank does not require you to live in your house for 30 years. So um, that's the same thing here. Our, our returns uh, get a bump. It's better for our shareholders if they do get uh, bought back, but we have to recycle that capital. Um, but again, this is all about keeping control in the, in the hands of the business owners. Uh, they, they don't lose their equity control, their board control, and they are in control of the refinancing event as well. And that is pretty unique in uh in in the in the marketplace that we that we rely on um just a couple things on on here i don't want to go through all these uh just to canter through the presentation but um you know we uh at the beginning of our fiscal year it was very tough um you know the the uh the pandemic was bearing down no one knew what was what was going to happen we had a a, a three month um bullet uh three month kind of game plan to make sure that we uh, and our royalty partners as we call them um had uh had had uh, liquidity to uh 
to, to manage through the uh, the business. So uh, for for our shareholders, you'll know that we that we changed to a script dividend for a couple of quarters as we assessed the health of our portfolio and helped our royalty partners uh, act like long term long term partners. Uh, we provided forbearance agreements. We took up board seats. We equitized some payments. Um, so we really we really preserved value for our shareholders long term, and actually got some uh, equity stakes that we think are going to be very valuable. The sure enough, there was a three month battle plan. Um, the economy recovered. Um, the sales recovered and, and the profits recovered in, inside our portfolio and, um, and, and we, and we monetized, um, some, some good, um, some good, uh, partners and, and, um, and equities. So <clears throat> we've, we, that was kind of the first half, uh, in the second half, you know, we've, uh, we've gone back on the front foot. We've, uh, we've hired a new chief investment officer, Peter Maduros. He actually came from our debt provider. So he saw firsthand the resilience of our portfolio and decided to join us. I thought that was a pretty good endorsement. Um, we had one royalty partner in February, 2021. We've added three more since the end of, of, of this, uh, of, of the last fiscal year. Um, the, 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 the credit facility that Peter was our relationship manager on uh, increased uh, in uh, in March of this year, so we're we're really extended. Uh, sorry, extended the term, um, increased the facility, and we're really excited about that. Um, uh, moreover, uh, we had uh, a great endorsement from our equity shareholders. We've got some great shareholders, uh, new and existing, on the register um, as a sign of uh, of their commitment to what we're doing, um, and um, so we're we're very pleased about that. But uh, let me um, let me hand over to Hugo now to go through the um, the um, rest of uh, the the financials. Yeah, many thanks, Neil, um, and afternoon, everyone. Um, just. From a sort of an overview perspective, I really just want to say from a, you know, the 12 months in question, bear in mind, we're talking the period of April 1st to March 31st, um, the 12 months, you know, right through the pandemic, you know, right at the beginning of the lockdown, you know, businesses everywhere, and I'm sure you'll all feel the same, were, you know, some very harshly affected. So for us to be able to produce a, a positive set of results when you know many companies throughout last year were issuing profit warnings suspending dividends um for us to come and produce what, what i feel is a very positive set of results um is very very pleasing indeed and i think it's testament to what neil um referred to in terms of the resilience of our business model um and shows that we've now sort of proven through the down cycle um as well as so you know great credit to the the company and and to everyone involved Moving into the snapshots, um, for those of you that, that sort of don't know us that well, we we pay we are a cash generated business. We we pay quarterly dividends, um, and I've always said judge us on our on our cash flow generation, um, and therefore you know it's extremely pleasing to be able to to sort of show that we we grew our our, our cash flows during during the twelve months in question. Top line cash revenue grew from ten point three million to eleven million. Um, and uh, and lower down operating cash flow and operating cash flow per share also increasing. I'd like to point out that you know the the, the increase in cash revenue is is even more pleasing considering um, the forbearance agreements that we put in place at the start of of April. Um, we 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 had a stated policy of um, supporting our royalty partners through this. We are a long term capital partner, um, so we want to work with our businesses. Um, and as such, in April last year, we, we, you know, we introduced these forbearance agreements with five of our partners to alleviate their short term liquidity constraints caused by COVID. Um, so that that is not lost cash revenue. Um, we have in some cases accrued that interest and I can go on to that later. And in other, in other cases, we've equitized it. And there's a there's a slide later on showing where we hold now equity stakes in a, in a number of our businesses. Um, the operating cash flow per share obviously went up from 3.17 to 3.68, as, as shown on the slide. Um, that was helped not only by the the increase in the top line cash revenue, but also you know a lot of <laughs> prudent cost control um, 
throughout the year we you know we negotiate with a lot of our service providers short term reductions in our um in our payments and we cut all non core operating expenses so you know it's a, it's a combination of sort of increase in the top line and but also very very fiscal prudence i think in in terms of our our own operating costs moving just to i've also included an adjusted earnings special i don't want to sort of totally ignore the income statement um the the reason I, I place a lot more emphasis on the cash flow statement, and it's why actually it's on my primary statement in the annual report. You'll see I'm probably the only company that actually reports my cash flow statement in front of all the others. Um, the income statement is very distorted by the fair value movements in our investments. Um, so we do include an adjusted earnings per share figure here, which really reflects more of the underlying operating performance of the business and i'll go come into um the sort of the royalty the valuation of the royalty investments and those fair value movements when we touch on on the balance sheet um but again very pleasing to see that the the adjusted earnings per share um total adjusted earnings increased from 5.2 to 6.6 million um resulting in 11 percent increase in in the adjusted earnings per share Moving on to the sort of the cash flow in a little bit more detail, we've obviously talked about the increase in the top line cash revenue, the reduction in the core operating expenses there, down from 2.3 to 1.85. Um, but a, a few other sort of points just to really sort of note on. You'll see the dividends obviously halved in FY21. Um, for those of you that are shareholders, you will know that we did suspend our cash dividend. Um, through that stated policy of preserving cash through the first half of the pandemic or the first half of the year right at the start of the pandemic we did continue to pay dividends through scrip um, so that number refers to purely the cash dividend the actual total dividend paid was up at um, six million i think it's also worth highlighting and i put in in this slide the investment deployments um, we did it back in april 2020 um, announced we sort of suspended all new investments for the very reason that we want to support our royalty partners, um, both if they had liquidity constraints, but also if opportunities presented themselves during sort of the times um, to make further acquisitions. So that 24.5 million of deployments through the year is, is very pleasing in the fact that that is only one new royalty partner, which we invested uh, with our new partner in Fabricat in uh, February 2021. So that's 18 million of follow on de um, deployments into existing royalty partners. So while many businesses have, have obviously struggled significantly through COVID, um, there have been opportunities um, for some of our royalty partners to, to go on sort of an, and acquire other businesses. Um, and, and it's uh, Myriad um, and UGG to name a couple of our royalty partners. Um, as well as Welltel, who absolutely ended up um, refinancing us out in, in December. Um, but to, to sort of deploy more, I think, in, in through the last 12 months than we did in the, in the prior year is a, you know, is, a, is a great testament to the investment team. Moving on to the balance sheet, you will see our um, royalty investment portfolio, loan investment equity, um, increasing from 85 to 94 million. Now, for those of you that don't know, we I value our royalty investments under IFRS 9. Um, the sort of technical, quick technical overview of that is I basically produce a model for every investment. It's a 30 year discounted cash flow um, and is very sensitive to the growth rates of our of our royalty partners. So last year um, we took 15 million of write downs um, because of COVID and because where a number of our businesses would have had plus six adjustment factors, those reversed to minus six. I've managed to claw back, we, or we have as a, as a business, claw back um, 10 million of those fair value write downs. Um, so the investment portfolio is now sitting a lot healthier than it was. Um, but again, alluding back to the, the, the income statements, that is why um, I sort of tend to veer away from the income statement because you'll see last year we made a, a loss of um, circa 9 million um, on account of those fair value write downs. Um, as opposed to a sort of 15 million um, profit this year. Um, so not necessarily reflective of the actual operating performance of the company. I will just point out a, a, one other sort of number in this in this balance sheet because it stands out in terms of our the other assets, which are up at 10.4 million. Um, 
as those of you that follow will know, we we sold our uh, riverboat assets um, on the 31st of March. That is a deferred payment over two, two and a half years, and we'll be expecting, I think, the final payments in June 23. So that other asset line will come down over the next couple of years. Next real side is really just sort of giving you slightly more detail in terms of the fair value of our royalty partners um, and sort of where we sit at the moment. Um, as I said last year, we took, you know, fairly significant write downs um, and the two box on the right top of, on the top of the screen on the right hand side, you'll see the fair value of the portfolio was 88 million, 10 million below its cost. So we were sitting roughly 10% below cost um, this time last year. Um, and those reversals have come through and now the fair value, which includes the, the equity investment portfolio, but we're now sitting at 5 million above cost. So if you take out the equity portfolio portion of that, which is 3.5 million, uh, the royalty uh, portion of that is sitting just above cost. And I think taking a step back intuitively, that feels very sort of about right. You know, last year it was very, very uncertain where um, the economy was going, um, whereas now I think there's a, there, there's a lot well, first of all, a lot of recovery has been seen, and I think people are much more bullish about the next sort of 24 months. So you would expect to see um, a rebound in the growth rates. Um, but ultimately, there is still uncertainty. Um, and so a, a portfolio sitting around cost, um, I think, is, is feels about right. I think it's worth pointing out as well. I, I know a lot of people often um, get very nervous about fair value movements and in terms of overvaluing portfolios. And I think the difference for us is that um, our model is constrained by that adjustment color. So you will never see our investments going up 50% in one year um, because the growth rates that drive our fair values can never fluctuate greater than 6% or less than 6%. Um, so I do always point people to the fact that while, yes, we are subject to these, these swings in fair value, um, it's very difficult. You'll never see sort of our portfolio sitting at 50, 60% above cost. Um, because the nature of the models just don't allow it. And it's worth just looking at a couple of these names. I'm sure Neil will go into a little bit more detail in terms of the portfolio in the next few slides, but you'll see a couple of our um, partners, which I alluded to, Myriad and UGG, they're now sitting sort of 7.5%, 3.5% above cost. Both of those, Myriad especially being, uh, you know, has benefited from the staycation boom um, and has seen significant write-ups this year. Um, UGG, um, took uh, an opportunity to make a sort of strategic acquisition in February 2021 um, and that massively reduced sort of its risk environment, um, increased its growth rates and again from a, a position where it was sitting you know fairly well below cost last year um, it's now sitting three and a half percent above cost and that's not to say that the three there that you'll see Trimite links and BIL which are now sit are still sitting below cost um, that's not to say that we're at all worried about those investments it's purely the recovery and the rebound and the growth rates hasn't been quite as strong possibly as as uh, other files like myriad and hence they're still sitting slightly below cost and i would very much hope over the next certainly the next 12 to 18 months that those final fair value movements will reverse so that's sort of my my take on the on the results um just to summarize again I think as a, as a business, we're, we're very, very happy with those results, you know, to produce a, an increase in cash flow generation over the 12 months that we had, I think is, as I said, a, a real testament to the model um, and a real testament to sort of those involved within the company. Back to you, Neil. Thank you, Hugo. Um, right, okay. Uh, yeah, let's, um, let's just, I, I was uh, looking at some of the comments um, and questions that you had. Um, want this to be interactive, so I'm going to I'm going to um, address some of those right now. Um, I won't spend uh, time on all our royalty partners. <clears throat> some of them, you know, we've certainly uh, been through before. Uh, there was a question uh, regarding uh, Trimite. Uh, Trimite is uh, not back to uh, full. It's out of forbearance, which um, when what we have done is um, is have a scheduled re repayment schedule um, and um, and that will be <clears throat> over a over a number of years and they can they that arrears we equitized a, a, a certain amount of payments up until October of last year and they're accruing uh, some payments because they're at they're they're paying half of what they should 
Um, so there is an accrual building, um, which will reverse um, the next fiscal year. So um, they are in a recovery phase. Uh, their, um, their, um, their sales are, are going uh, uh, very well. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's one of the, the, the tales which, which is uh, part of the recovery. Your sales are going up. Uh, your cost of goods also go up, so prices are increasing. Inflation is coming in. We can see that across the trimites, the uh, the glass, uh, yeah, the myriad, um, the the, uh, the some of the some of the auto parts, um, and uh, Fabricat as well. One of our new royalty partners that is in uh, steel fabrication um, and steel prices. They've had to increase the price, but these are all industry. Um, industry uh, characteristics not affecting our companies any more than anyone else. So the whole industry prices are, are, are going up and being managed. Um, so that's Trimite, um, a little bit on others. Um, Interhealth was another uh, one in forbearance and they are back to full payments um, as of January of this year, as a matter of fact. So for a long time, um, they've been in, um, in compliance. Again, they wanted to accrue, not equitize uh, the, the missed payments. So that's, um, that's going to be a bonus in the future. We have a solution there. Um, but, uh, but again, um, their, their, COVID, <clears throat> their COVID happened right as they were opening hospitals, which delayed the opening of the hospitals and that revenue. And, um, and the one hospital that, uh, that, was, uh, that is open uh, is the Turks and Caicos countries um, hospital system that they, that they run. Um, and COVID has affected them in, uh, in ways, uh, or did, um, which was the forbearance. And now, um, and now they're back to full payments and and uh, and uh, and fully fully back uh, um, on the right foot. Um, the other question that I that I that we had was about um, uh, Creo and uh, some of the new investments that uh, that we've made. Um, let's just take all all four of them. Fabricat UK based uh, MBO um, in steel fabrication is like. Uh, lamp posts and uh, guardrails for for councils and there's only three or four of them in the uk and uh so it's a little oligopoly very good business and we and we uh and we now long-term managers are now the owners of the business and uh, have been there for 30 years we really like that that uh that very nice and boring uh company um uh, fairmed is uh, generics it's in healthcare uh jim webster our our um uh, in um Chairman of the Investment Committee really was a, a royalty a healthcare royalty specialist, um, and uh, so as a European uh, regulatory and marketing arm of a large uh, Indian um, a generics manufacturer, uh, that is uh, that's one from uh, from Switzerland. Uh, and Intec is uh, very it's very similar to Welltel that got uh, that got. Um, refinanced, uh, bought back last year. Um, what it does is uh, IT services. And um, so when uh, for small businesses, they provide the maintenance and, um, and, and services for, uh, for, your, for a company's computers and, uh, and software systems. And uh, so they are, this is a buy and build. <clears throat> and so they've actually bought eight companies. And we uh, and they've been around for 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 five years. And most importantly, the companies that they're buying are longstanding profitable businesses. So so this is a buy and build. But what they're buying is is as core to the the investment thesis for Duke. Um, Lynx is the other one. Lynx was is a we're at the holding call, um, and we are the the senior security of of the holding company for Lynx Equity UK, which has now seven different companies underneath it, all of them longstanding profitable businesses. So uh, the question about Creotech, one of them was, um, is that a new company and why isn't it longstanding and profitable? The, the way I guess the RNS read um, is that Creotech, <laughs> Creotech the, the holding company is new, but the two companies that we bought, just like Lynx, just like Intech, 
there they are um, from the 1990s and uh, 2003 been around for 20 to 30 years uh, profitable companies uh, niche EPC businesses we're marrying them together they're also uh, a buy and build strategy that we can uh, we can drive synergies in those businesses um, and uh, so we like that business. It's it's very much uh, on track. So uh, apologies if the RNS read that we were doing something that we that we uh, usually don't do. Um, the other question about Creotech is uh, that I'm I'm really excited about is that is in um, in uh, Canada, and um, you know our our thesis is we're bringing a Canadian. Um, royalty concept that's been that's been developed over decades uh, for the first time into the UK, and um, and so the UK shareholders like all of us on the uh, on the um, on the phone, and and the and the European or UK um, small businesses uh, SME businesses that we're investing into have never had the opportunity to either bring the capital or or uh, invest in this sector before um, and uh, you know there's there's there has never been um, a, a UK only focus on this the river boats were in uh, were in um, the Netherlands um, we've had Irish companies and and um, and so Western Europe and North America has has been uh, part of the strategy um, but <clears throat> in North America, we have um, competition, but at least we have educated uh, companies. In in um, in the UK and, and wider Europe, we don't have much competition in, in royalties, but we have a lot of education to do. It's getting easier because we have more and more um, and knowledge and a, and a presence in the market. But opportunistically, uh, like for example, Creotech, uh, I've known uh, one of the one of the founders uh, for 20 years. We have networks here. Jim's from Toronto. Justin Cochran, you guys might remember, um, uh, who's on our investment committee um, and been in royalties forever. We have a we have a presence and a network in North America that opportunistically we're going to we're going to do. And and uh, I'm here for the shareholders. I'm a big shareholder. Um, and uh, we we uh, founded this with uh, Charlie Brooks with our own money. Um, so I'm, I'm a very large shareholder. What I'm here for is to get the best shareholder returns. And, um, and uh, that those, um, the, the Swiss deals and the Canadian deals are actually more tax efficient uh, because of our Guernsey Topco than, uh, than UK deals. So I'm gonna make sure that I work for the shareholders um, and we um, and we do the best the best deals uh, with the lowest risk and highest return that we can. Um, but uh, Creotech is is uh, very much a, a, a boring and long established uh, um, companies um, that we're that we're building there. So um, boring is the new exciting, as we say. Um, let's just uh, continue on. I. I am happy to take more questions as well. So uh, I'm answering a few, but um, but uh, we'll leave time at the end for other questions. Um, in this slide <clears throat> is our exits. And I think the pleasing thing about fiscal 21 and 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 today on the phone that we can um, that we can shout from the rooftops is is not only that we've proven that we are resilient in a downturn, which was was uh, was the a core tenant of of our investment thesis, but we had never lived through a downturn. I could point to another company and another geography and another team and another portfolio and say we're going to replicate that. But until we've lived through a downturn, um, we couldn't say we've done it. Um, I don't wish another downturn like we like we've lived through. Um, but uh, to say that uh, we've now uh, come come uh, through and uh, demonstrated to our investors um, that we uh, what what our core thesis is is pleasing. And the second the second thing that we're talking about today, especially on this page, is that we can demonstrate to our royalty partners that that it benefits them for for taking our capital and that's because we've had buyouts and um and welltel uh and uh, extreme push uh accelerated their business plan 
<clears throat> COVID came along and the work from home, Welltel was in that in that telecommunication services, and uh, you know what what they thought would take them five years was was here in three, and, uh, and they sold to private equity, and it was their choice. Um, we we got a, a nice return of uh, 27 percent uh, IRR. They uh, they had a ten x on their invested capital, so they're they're very very happy. Um, and, uh, and we, and, and they were in control of their exit. So these kind of things that that's the second part of, of, of fiscal 21 is that, uh, the recycling of capital, it's good for our shareholders, but it's, but it's good for the royalty partners. And that, and that will just indicate to more and more, uh, business owners, that we are a, a good partner to take instead of the banks when when things go bad, uh, they they uh, they want their money as as fast as they can get it back. They're not here for the long term. Um, the banks uh, were were uh, you know were uh, their banks banks names were muddied again in the media uh, in this in this downturn just like they were in 08. and um, so that um, our our royalty partners you know mistrust the banks and and so when we can say there's no refinancing risk um and we're long-term partners it sure helps when we can show them um uh some uh some positive exits for uh for for business owners um so we like that um let me go to um just a little bit because um you know, we are in September. We're headed to October, um, and um, you know, we've we've had five months of uh, this fiscal year. Um, a little bit about the the market. Uh, I said at the, at the beginning that we believe that uh, you know, in a post COVID environment, uh, companies will will look for alternative financing. When there's short term uncertainty, they look for long term solutions, and uh, and certainly. Um, the uh, the non bank uh, industry, as you can see, uh, the bottom of the slide has doubled over the last ten years, and <clears throat> and um, that's a global number. Um, there are there are lots of different flavors of of that, but for for the SME business owner, the ones that have, we provide that alternative to the banks, that is only going one way. The banking regulations that 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 basically preclude the banks from from having uh, competitive terms to uh, SME businesses open the door for us to to uh, provide um, solutions for that subset the, for those business owners that do not want to sell their businesses we are we are in that niche uh, but it is expanding and we have been doing um, a lot of uh, a lot of business I mean we We've uh, we've done four deals this year, calendar year. Um, we're evaluating uh, a, a great number of, of uh, new opportunities. Um, you know, the number is about 125 already this year. Uh, we've done four. We've evaluated 125 companies, and we've written four checks. So, um, you know, the the uh, the criteria is very is very um, uh, specific. Our um, our due diligence is very rigorous. We have McKinsey and Company do commercial due diligence with us. We have a partnership with them that is very uh, taxi, uh, very easy on on uh, on our cash flows. There's no broken deal costs. We don't pay them unless we we write a check. So it's a very uh, partnership model. Um, that uh, that we have, but what that means is that we're very picky with our with our uh, with our cash, and basically with your with your hard earned uh, investment dollars, what uh, we're we're good shepherds of that, and I think uh, you'll see more of the same uh, in the uh, months and, and years to come. Um, I won't dwell on this, uh, but as you can see, um, you know, right at the top, it's uh, the the, the buy-in builds, the management buyouts, and really capitalizations, equity recapitalizations. When a majority owner has some minority equity partners that that want to want exit, 
you know, this is a way for him to increase his equity stake and and have a silent partner um, that uh, that he keeps control of his business. Um, we like those types of situations. And really, it's that refinancing risk that uh, we take away <clears throat> and also the free cash flow impact on the uh, on the years right down at the bottom there is um, is light. Those are the two types of things that that the business owners love. Um, I talked about Fabricat. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this because I'd like to uh, to keep some good um, time for questions. Um, and uh, and let's just wrap up. Um, the the um, as Hugo says, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a pleasing uh, year for us. Uh, we did have um, new equity raised in April. Um, we're now at record cash quarterly revenues. Uh, we have the momentum with four new royalty partners. Um, <clears throat> um, we, we know that uh, the market opportunity is expanding uh, here in the UK um, and, and in, our, in our markets. What we have to do is, is ensure that more and more trusted advisors, intermediaries uh, know about our product to pitch us um, and we're seeing the we're seeing the fruits of our of our labor over the last four years. Um, there was one question about the liquidity, so that that answers that. It's fifty five million pounds. Um, that's basically where we're net cash neutral. We have um, we have the thirty five million pounds of the Palm Street plus the accordion, uh, and um, with the with the uh, pipeline that we have, uh, we feel that. You know, I, I can't say for certain, but we'll certainly be doing more deals between now and the end of uh, end of March. And um, you know, I, I we got to get it through our investment committee and our board, and uh, and pass due diligence. So um, and no promises, but uh, but you know, the the past um, I feel is confident about uh, you know the upcoming six to twelve months as I as I did um, about six to twelve months ago. So. Um, that should give you some comfort. Um, great. I think uh, that's the end of our presentation. The other that's slides great. are appendix. We can that's talk great. to them if there's any other uh, questions, particularly on them. That's great. Neil, Hugo, thank you very much indeed for updating investors. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those investor questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investor Meet company dashboard. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company, and immediately after this presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Neil, Hugo, obviously investors had the ability to pre-submit questions. Perhaps I could just start off the Q&A uh, with those and then if I could hand back to you to read out the questions and give a response where it's appropriate to do so. Um, the first question that we received ahead of today's event, um, how much capacity do you currently have left in your debt facility? Combined with cash and assuming a reasonable liquidity buffer, how much firepower do you have currently for further royalty deals? I think, um, like I said, I think Neil has effectively answered that right at the end. There, we we're, we're currently in a cash neutral position, um, so we have a, a, a thirty five million pound facility with Pollen Street with an extra twenty million accordion. So we have fifty five currently fifty five million um, of spare liquidity and firepower to invest. Perfect. Thank you. Apologies. Um, next question. Funds similar to you in the US and the Canadian markets have billion dollar valuations and more established and mature. If your five, 10 year plan to seek growth in this direction to dominate the UK market or remain steady in a mid cap sized company, therefore, what should I really expect as a long term investor? Well, very good question. Um, you know, our our uh, we believe that a, that a bigger company um, reduces the risk. Uh, reduces the risk for shareholders in a number of ways, uh, better liquidity in the stock, uh, no more number of uh, larger number of royalty partners, uh, bigger size, uh, which um, which should be a uh, a, a more uh, less risky investment. Um, so we um, <clears throat> we have uh, and now in the last two years we've introduced a a line of credit. So um, so we're building. Um, 
we're building. Uh, we think that as the market expands, we have a, a, a big opportunity to uh, to put more capital to work. Um, you know, the, the, the most important thing that, that an investment company needs to convey to you is that with, with more capital, um, our, our operating leverage kicks in. And uh, now we're at, uh, we've hired a CIO and, and, uh, and a junior. That doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't move the dial too much on our, on our operating overheads. And therefore, every new, um, every new investment, um, you know, that goes straight down to the bottom line in terms of profits. So that's the operating leverage that we talk about. And so more capital is better per share. So our shares should go up. Um, now that we're hopefully we're behind all the crises that we have, I, we were talking about Brexit when we started, uh, and now we're talking about COVID and and uh, in a post-COVID world, it'll be a new normal. But I think we we know that um, we can live with this disease and we can live with uh, Brexit as well. So these uh, these things we'll have to both live with. But hopefully, there's no um, there's no um, existential threat on the horizon. Um, and we, uh, we now have a full team. So our, so our costs don't have to increase at the, at the, at the rate that they had to when we started. Um, and that means on a per share basis, the cash flow per share is going to go up. That means we can improve our dividend per share. And that means, you know, all things being equal, the, um, the stock, uh, will, uh, will, will go up if the, if the dividend yield stays the same. And I can, and I can um, see that uh, a bigger company, you know, that yield compression will also kick in as well. So um, we're uh, we're happy to be the leaders in uh, in this market. As I said, we are opportunistically looking in in Europe and North America, um, but uh, but on a on a basis of of what's the best um, what's the best return for the lowest risk for our shareholders. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I think you, in fact, did touch upon the other pre-submitted questions. So in the interest of time, perhaps if I could just hand back to you guys, um, if you'd be so kind as to read out the question, who it's from, and give a response, and I'll pick up uh, when you're ready. Yeah. Neil, I can, I, I'll have it sent. Why first do you one. do one? I haven't read them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You read a few. I'll do a couple. Um, I can do the first one very quickly. Peter W has asked, how do you set about valuing the investments and how often are they audited? Um, as I alluded to earlier, we each investment has its own model. It's a 30-year discounted cash flow analysis. Um, I'm audited once a year, um, and the auditors go through a huge amount of detail um, analyzing those investments and analyzing my models. Um, and it's why we release our results in September on the back of a March year end. Um, the audit process is about two and a half, three months um, analyzing that. So while we are only audited once a year, I obviously do a sort of recaps after six months for the interims and check um, kind of how the companies are trending against the, the the growth rate, the immediate growth rates that we've used. So, although we're only audited once a year, obviously there's there, there is more um, that goes into it than just that. Um, so, and then the second question was: There's a few questions about the equity stakes. Um, I'll read out. Dave Ars asked: You increased the book value of equity investment and partners to around three and a half million. The valuation is based on a PE applied to their profits, but many partners made little, if any, profit in 2021. Do you consider the book value materially undervalues the equity if these stakes were bought back by management or sold to private equity? Um, good question. You <laughs> um, you make a good point. I mean, ultimately, yes, uh, all of our business act actually are and have been um, profitable, apart from uh, probably obviously the, um, the 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 riverboats where the industry shut down completely. Um, the equity stakes are based on very conservative, very conservative. Um, market EBITDA multiples um, and are based off uh, FY21 forward-looking um, EBITDA. Do I consider them to be materially undervalued? Um, it, in all honesty, I, I think there probably is some upside there on the basis that the auditors are very, very tight on the multiples they use. And I, I'll touch very briefly um, BHP, which we exited in, uh, in August, um, exited on a multiple in the region of 9 to 10. Um, that was uh, the multiple used in the valuation at year end was was six. Um, so you know there is upside in the fact that the the auditors are, are punitive on on analysing the, the multiples that I use. So 
are they materially undervalued? Um, probably not material. Well, depends what you call material, but I think there is definitely um, value upside in those equity stakes. Um, I've seen a couple of questions just in regards to um, how many, um, well, there's, there's two that I'd like to touch on. One topic is uh, how many, how many companies uh, can you uh, comfortably hold uh, and, uh, and analyze and, and monitor? Um, you know, we, we, as I, as I alluded to, Peter Maduris uh, is full-time in London um, and he's come from Pollen Street Capital uh, as our chief investment officer, as well as, uh, which we didn't publish, was uh, we, we, we had one um, junior join us as well on the investment team. So we're, we're at nine uh, employees. Just by way of reference, uh, there's a, a Canadian company, Alaris Equity Partners, has 14 people. They run a billion dollars, which is 600 million pounds, um, as uh, as their as their book. So uh, we we feel that very comfortable that we can get to 20 20 royalty partners with the uh, with the current team uh, without any uh, without breaking a sweat. Um, that could be 250 to 300 million pounds, um, and. Um, and we were recycling the capital. I think there's a there's a number of uh, question about you know can can you keep up with the investments? I would say that I think COVID accelerated a number of those refinancings. So uh, we wouldn't expect five in a year. We might expect one or two. So it'll be easy for us to uh, to get to twenty, um, not too far. Um, there was one other topic that you know, I was I was looking at. Okay, yes, there's there's a number of topics about the dilution and, and equity placings and um, and uh, you know I I I think I touched uh, on that without reading a, a bunch of these questions, but just to just to um, just to let uh, you know we we are conscious of the um, the dilution um, every every time we have an equity placement and the and the cash drag that 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 does i think the <clears throat> the line of credit that we have alleviates that we'll we'll go into you know a, a 50 million pound debt position and then a 50 million dollar placement would would have no cash drag um and and we would we would just swap that debt to to equity and be debt free so that would be a boost um but um, going forward, when someone talks about, you know, the, the five to 10 year future, um, you know, we we want um, as shareholders ourselves, um, C shares or uh, structured debt or um, third party capital um, to uh, to really have um, Duke Royalty and the and the PLC be the engine um, for more and more um, hybrid strategies, royalty strategies. Um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're here. And, and I think, um, y if you believe, uh, if you're a shareholder, I hope you know that, you know, we, uh, we, we are really uh, adamant about, um, delivering on our promises and, uh, and, and doing what we said we're going to do. Um, so, um, you know, pandemics, uh, aside, but, um, but we, uh, but we're here for the shareholders. So we, we constantly evaluate that. And, and part of uh, why Peter is here, um, after, after, um, um, founding different private debt strategies at his old, his old shop, um, he really loves this model and, uh, how we can tweak it for, um, the benefit of our shareholders. We're not going to do anything, um, off strategy. Um, but, um, but something that we can do, um, that, uh, alleviates that, that, that cycle, um, as we get bigger and as we have a five-year track record, it'll be five years next year. You know, those, those milestones and 250 million pounds, uh, is, is a milestone. And these things, these things matter as you, uh, as you get bigger. Um, but, uh, you know, when you start out, you need to do one strategy. You have options when you're when you're bigger. Um, now, I'll just I'll touch on a, another topic. Actually, there seems to be themes on some of these questions. Um, there's a couple of questions here um, talking about our dividend policy um, and uh, a question from Chris. Will first quarter income 
is at record levels. Will this lead to an increase in dividends later this year? Our dividend policy in, our, in the admission document was sort of a, and, and generally how we see it is sort of paying out 80 to 90% of our free cash flow. Um, that's what we, we intend to do um, in the immediate future. Um, will the record levels of incoming lead to increased dividends? I would hope so. I, look, I, I can't sit down here and tell you we've just announced um, we maintain the dividend at 0. Point, um, uh, 0.055p, I think 0.55p um, a couple of days ago. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say 100% yes, um, but it would be natural to assume that as our cash generation per share increases, we will try and increase the dividends. You know, we, we've always said we pay a quarterly dividend. We're a high yielding um, stock. So we would like to increase the dividend when we feel it's appropriate. And our history proves that that piece is, uh, Absolutely. I mean, the dividend was was annualized, you know, pre-COVID, the dividend was up at 3p um, annualized. Um, I, I like I like the dividends. I, I'm, I'm in favor. All in favor. You do. Um, great. Uh, Mark, do we have, um, let's see, sorry, I, I should have been looking. Um, I can ask a very quick one, Keith B, can you enlarge on how the accordion facility works? Yes, we draw down to our, our 35 million term. Um, at that point, if we have further investments to make, um, we will speak to Pollen Street, who will do a little bit more work. Um, to check that they're comfortable with uh, our LTV levels, et cetera. And then we will um, effectively request a drawdown on that accordion. So it's it's a it's a partnership with Pollen Street. Um, I don't see any reason in the world that they wouldn't give um, us access to that accordion. Um, and then it's just, it's it works on the same basis as our current facility. We will just draw down um, and, and repay as and when. I, I've got one here. Um... This is uh, Stuart G. What is the most exciting opportunity in the pipeline in your mind? And can a shift towards sustainable, environmentally conscious companies be seen? Uh, the first question is uh, probably um, Myriad, which, uh, which at the time in 2019 was the UK's largest uh, RV and caravan parts distributor um, and uh, was pretty boring. But boy, did that get exciting very quickly um, with uh, the staycation market and they're kind of they're kind of uh, smashing through their their budgets um, pre COVID. So uh, we do have a 24 percent equity stake in that in that business. And uh, so um, that one was is uh, is is higher and uh, more exciting. It is on the top of our of our list now of uh, over fair value. Uh, sorry, over cost. Uh, so that's that. Um, I, we, let's talk about ESG. Uh, we <clears throat> we have a policy that's on our website. Please refer to that. Um, it's responsible investing. Uh, it it talks about um, it talks about putting putting that into our due diligence and our criteria, which we have done um, and reporting on 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 our ESG. I, I'll tell you a couple examples that, um, you know, for example, Trimite that has been a royalty partner since 2018, um, you know, is in industrial coatings. However, um, I'm on the board and we have mandated uh, the environment as uh, one of our core um, strategies to get better and better. So this is about, um, this is about, uh, you know, a, a conscious shift to, um, to getting uh, more environmentally responsible. Um, so they're doing that. Um, for our criteria, for example, we passed on a very, uh, would have been a very, uh, uh, on the face of it, a very a cheap uh, transaction, i.e. high uh, return for, for us to get involved in an alcohol beverage company. Um, but um, but we've, we, uh, we passed on that, uh, on that opportunity. Um, and um, so, so that's an example of of our um, of our ESG policy in in uh, in action. I 
think that's probably um, probably time. I think, Mark. If it's, I was, uh, yeah, no, I was just going to jump in and say it, it seems for every one question you answer, somebody's sending you another. So, <laughs> I think possibly in the interest of time, make. I mean, firstly, may I thank all the investors for taking the time to submit these questions, and of course, you know, we'll make everything available where appropriate. We'll publish uh, responses on our website if we haven't got through them today. Um, but I know investor feedback is important to you guys, and before I shortly redirect investors to provide you with their thoughts and expectations, perhaps now I could ask you just for a few closing comments to wrap up with and then i'll divert investors to let you know uh, what they're thinking well i i uh the poll is uh, 91 percent that we're uh we're shareholders so uh so that um that is uh, very pleasing to see and thank you that that's that's my um my message to you um it uh it was um, a very, uh, you know, it was, it was a very stressful time for all investors in March of 2020, and and certainly uh, we had some sleepless nights uh, looking just purely on our stock price, but um, but the but the resiliency of our team and the resiliency of of everyone involved in Duke Royalty and our royalty partners, I um, I'm I'm pleased with the with the outcome, and I'm pleased that you're here with us. Um, thank you for for coming along for the ride, and and again, I think uh, we look with um, with optimism uh, to the future and uh, be safe out there. Neil Hugo, thank you once again for updating investors this afternoon. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as we will now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Duke Royalty Limited, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Good afternoon to you all.